Our scripture reading for this fourth Sunday in Lent is from Ezekiel 37. So listen for the word of the Lord. The Lord's power overcame me. This is Ezekiel speaking here. And while I was in the Lord's spirit, he led me out and set me down in the middle of a certain valley. It was full of bones. He led me through them all around, and I saw that there were a great many of them on the valley floor, and they were very, very dry. He asked me, human one, can these bones live again? And I said, Lord God, only you know. God said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the Lord's word. The Lord God proclaims to these bones, I am about to put breath in you and you will live again. I will put sinews in you, place flesh on you, and cover you with skin. When I put breath in you and you come to life, you will know that I am the Lord. I prophesied just as I was commanded. And there was this great noise as I was prophesying. Then a great quaking and the bones came together, bone by bone. When I looked, suddenly there were sinews on them. The flesh appeared and, and they were covered with skin. But there was still no breath in them. God said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, human one, say to the breath, the Lord God proclaims, come from the four winds breath, breathe into these dead bodies and let them live. I prophesied just as he commanded me. When the breath entered them, they came to life and stood on their feet, an extraordinarily large company. God said to me, human one, these bones are the entire house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is perished. We are completely finished. So now prophesy and say to them, the Lord God proclaims, I'm opening your graves. I will raise you up from your graves, my people, and I will bring you to Israel's fertile land. You will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you up from your graves, my people. I will put my breath in you and you will live. I will plant you on your fertile land and you will know that I am the Lord. I've spoken, and I will do it. This is what the Lord says. So friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> so if you are an upstanding citizen, there are places in life where the second you enter, you surrender most, if not all, of your agency. Places like getting on a roller coaster, think about it, going to the emergency room, sitting in the accountant's office, and especially going to the DMV. Two weeks ago, my husband and I went to the DMV to upgrade our regular old driver's licenses to enhanced licenses. By adding the word enhanced, an American flag in the corner and special microchips, these new licenses are supposed to allow us to get onto a domestic flight into Mexico, Canada, and the Caribbean without passports. And I'm sure some of you have these special enhanced licenses. So, we wait in line to fill out the form. 
then we hand over our old licenses, our birth certificates, our W-2s, and our social security cards. Then we wait in another line for the photos. Photos are taken, then we're back to the first desk, and we're handed all of our paperwork back. Then we go to another line to wait for the cashier. <sighs> Thinking we're almost done, the cashier goes, Huh. Uh-oh. The Social Security Administration happened to be down, the system was down statewide, and our licenses couldn't be processed without the DMV system being able to talk to the Social Security system. Can you come back later? The cashier asks. Hmm, well, hmm, we reply. Do you want to wait a minute to see if it goes through? And we both nod. A minute or two later, everything went through, we pay our debt, and off we go. So from start to finish, I realized how little agency we had over the whole experience. So even before we got there, the internet told us what documentation we needed. Upon arrival, we were told where to stand, what form to fill out, and where we could sit while we were filling it out. Then we were told which desk to go to, how much to pay. We had so little control over the process to get that little plastic card that will speak to our legitimacy as upstanding American citizens. And then with the little spinning circle on a computer screen, indicating that the system couldn't connect and it was down, we almost didn't have any agency over the outcome of the whole visit. And so we meet Elijah, who prophesies about this valley filled with dry bones. So God tells Elijah to prophesy over the bones, telling them that God will bring life into the bones. So Elijah did as God asked him, and the bones started to rattle and then form into skeletons. Tissues, tendons, ligaments followed and then skin, but there was still no life, no breath in these bodies. So God told Elijah to prophesy again, saying that God will bring the four winds together which will give them breath. So when Elijah did as God asked him, the aerated bodies jumped to their feet and comprised this large company of people. And then God says this to Elijah, human one, these bones are the entire house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope has perished we are completely finished. And God told Elijah to prophesy one more time over the people, telling them that God will open their graves and bring them to the fertile land of Israel. God will give them breath and they will live in plenty in the land of Israel. So this story is on the unsettling side. And it's one of the more visually frightening stories in the Bible. And when you see it in children's Bibles, the skeletons are friendly looking and almost comical. But when we think about it as adults, the rattling of the bones, the veins and cartilage forming on the bones, the skin coming together, bodies lying there without any breath. Those are pretty frightening images. But let's look at this in a little bit of a different way. So the question for this week is, can these bones live? As far as this section of Ezekiel goes, the answer is obviously yes. But what was the interplay here? between Elijah's agency and God's action. 
Was it Elijah prophesying over the bones and bodies that brought life to them? Or was it God's revelation of life that really didn't need Elijah to do his thing? The larger question here is what is our agency when it comes to God? How do we find our way in the tension between agency and surrender? Lent is the season of the year where we live in that tension. We want to be faithful people of God who do all the stuff that God wants us to do. But it's hard to find time to read the Bible. It's difficult to really focus when we pray. And really, we just kind of do the devotional to get it done so we can move on to our to-do list for the day. I mean, we're human after all, right? And if we can't stop or suspend the action of God, it really feels like we don't have much agency in life anyway. But we do. And Lent is the perfect time to use our agency. It is that time of year that we take the sinfulness of our human condition and we bring that to God. We apologize and ask for forgiveness for what we've done and make a conscious effort to do and to be better. And this doesn't just mean that we ask for forgiveness for eating that third cupcake last Wednesday, but it can also look like asking for forgiveness for that time we were in second grade and pushed a classmate down on the ground and they got hurt. It can look like asking for forgiveness for that time 20 years ago when someone really needed us and we weren't there. And it can mean asking for forgiveness for getting annoyed at a partner or spouse for leaving the cap off the toothpaste again. And this is the part of our relationship with God where we have total agency. We have 100% total agency with what we do with our sinfulness. Can we make dry bones rattle and come to life? Most likely not. But can we take serious stock of our lives, look backward at the sins we've committed, and then look forward to Christ's resurrection at Easter? It's essential to do the work of examining ourselves before we can come to that empty tomb at Easter. If we don't, Easter is about rabbits and chocolate and eggs, and we go to church on Easter morning because, well, that's what we always do on Easter morning. And Easter comes every year, even when we're not ready for it, even when the special music could use another rehearsal or two, even when the flowers are wilted, and even when the sermon isn't just quite there yet. Just as Elijah couldn't stop God and what God was trying to do with breathing life into the bones, into Israel, we can't stop Jesus' resurrection. But what we do have agency over is whether or not we come to Easter as repentant and forgiven people. So can these bones live? Amen.